All right, so we're in our third week of our character series, okay? This is our last week in our character se series. We've been talking for the last three weeks, including this one, so we've been talking about our character and how important and how vital it is as a child of the king, right, that our character should bring him glory and not defame him. Amen? And so, so I want to talk to you about, God led me this three weeks ago, this, this, this topic here. It is very important for our character. Okay? Uh, this was a, a watershed moment in this guy's life. When I got saved at 15 years of age, uh, I'm going to talk about that moment. I'm not going to judge that. But, but there were some decisions when I accepted Christ that needed to be made in my life. If I didn't make these certain decisions, the character I would have in Christ would be tarnished and diminished. Things would have been differently if I didn't make, especially what I'm going to be talking today, this decision in my life. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't make this decision in my life. We're going to go to the book of 1 Corinthians this morning. I you to flip there, chapter 15. 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. This morning we're talking about keeping good company. Keeping good company. Company. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 33 and 34. Y'all hear that? Y'all hear that? Not everybody's on the clock yet. That's good. I like that. That's good. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 and 34, God's absolute truth says this. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Read that again. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Father, I love you so much, God, and I am up here. And God, I just pray with all my heart that I am just a vessel and an instrument. This is not about me. This is all about you and your absolute truth, your word. And so, Holy Spirit, I have been asking you all morning, rule and reign because you already rule and you already reign. You're God. But God, everybody in this room needs to open our minds, our ears, and our hearts. And Holy Spirit, I pray you do that today. I pray you open me wide open. And Holy Spirit, you flood and fill this life. And you flow out from me. We need a, you. We need your word this morning. And some may be in this room, God, and, and maybe they were like me so many years ago, and we just... Take it for granted, your word, and, and we think, well, it's no big deal. But God, I've come to realize in my walk with you that we need your word more than we need breath in our lungs. So God, I pray with all my heart. Let this not about be about my opinions or my thoughts. But help me, Holy Spirit, to convey clearly your absolute truth this morning. I thank you for doing so. I love you. I want to bring you glory in the next few months. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So earlier in this chapter, if we were to back up and look a little bit, earlier in this chapter, uh, Paul, here, Paul here is talking to the Corinthian church. And here's what he says in verse 3 and 4. He says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He says to the Corinthian believers, he says, he says, I have shared, I delivered to you what's of first importance. And what's first importance? Jesus Christ, his gospel, the fact that he came, he lived, he died, and he rose for us to bring us salvation. Right? Amen. So he came to bring the gospel. He says, that's what I delivered to you of, of first importance. That everything that Christ did, the gospel, he did it according to the word of God. This is the gospel according to the scriptures. But there were some 
coming with into the Corinthian believers' lives and into the church who were sharing a different gospel. They were sharing a different gospel. They were coming in and saying there's, there's no resurrection of the dead. And so the Corinthian believers have been told the true gospel. But now they have these people around them that they are listening to. And because they're around these people, they're beginning to believe some of the things they're being taught. We read this in verse 12 when it says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? See, these people are coming in and saying, saying there's no resurrection of the dead. He says, they know, you know the true gospel. You know that you've been taught the true gospel. I delivered it to you according to what? Not my opinions, not my beliefs. I delivered it to you according to the word of God. You know it. So how in the world can some of you say this? Because they're listening to bad company. They allow an influence to come into their life. They're, they're listening to and eating with and engaging with bad company. And the scripture here says, guess what? Bad company ruins good morals. Bad company ruins good morals. This particular bad company in this historical account of Corinthians, they've begun to twist those believers and in, in twist their understanding of the true gospel. Now Paul tells them and, and tells us again, that bad company ruins, ruins good morals. Our character, now hear me, our character will get wrecked when we choose to listen to and hang out and, and be around all the time bad company. That's right. It'll ruin our character. The word for deceived here means to go astray. To be seduced to wander. Can I tell you, bad company will lead us away from God's truth. Bad company will lead us astray. Can I tell you something about bad company? Bad company is seductive. It will suck you in before you realize it. I've been in ministry a long time now. I praise God for that. I, I really praise that. I, I praise Him so much. I, I pray that I can be in ministry. I, I pray that I can be 90 years old still in ministry. Uh, or, or older. I just praise God for the ability to be used by me. And I've been ministering a long time. And I've seen my share of gossip groupies and ungodly unions. Have you? I've seen my share of them. Gossip group. I call them gossip groupies and ungodly unions. We've all seen them. Anyone here today ever found out that they were excluded from the GTA club? Y'all say, what is that? Oh, that's the Gossip Group Anonymous Club. You weren't invited to it. You know why you weren't invited to it? Because they're talking about you. <laughs> that's why you didn't get invited to GTA. It's not for you. They're talking about you. Say, so your ears are burning? Yeah, they're on fire. I think one of them fell off. Been burning up. <laughs> Their sole purpose for gathering is to talk about you. We have all been there. Haven't we? Haven't we all been there? And let's be honest. If we're, if we're in this moment, we've all been there. We've all been excluded from the GGA club. We've all been talked about. We've all been there, and it hurts. Can we be honest? It hurts. It hurts us all. As a minister, I've been greatly saddened by those who tell me how much they love and respect me. But guess what? Then I hear all these things that their people say about me behind my back. Can I tell you? It hurts. It's painful. You've been there. I've been there. We've been there. Uh, uh, people, you, you ever been there when the GGA club was a group of your friends? Or at least you thought they were. Right? I mean, like, you're talking, you're hanging out, you're, you're having these great conversations, and you find out that they're talking, they're meeting, and they're talking all about you. 
It's not as if they just stabbed you in the back. They're still twisting the blade. <clears throat> when we hear the words, when we see the GGA clubs, you know what happens to that group of people? Do you think in our hearts and in our minds that their character is risen? Oh, no. It's lowered. When we see and we hear the GGA clubs, the character that we once had in them goes down, doesn't it? Because you've been there. I've been there. There's people that we thought would never do that. They would never talk behind our backs. And then they do it. And then all of a sudden, this, this picture we had of them, of this person, this man, this woman, of great impeccable character, of great Christian integrity, all of a sudden, shh, And it affects how you treat them, doesn't it? Like you still try to be loving, but you're still hurt, right? And so you're around them and they come up to you and like, hey, how's your day? And you're like, oh, it's good, you sack of lump of junk. <laughs> Don't act all Christian. You think it too. Come on. You know? And, and it does. And we, we're just human, right? Over the years, I've witnessed good-hearted people get sucked in to gossip groupies. Get sucked into them. Not intending to. All of a sudden they find themselves with a group of two or three. Two or three or more gathered together. There can be the Lord, but there can also be Satan. <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, all oh, this talk and this negativity is there. And you're caught in the middle of it. And you're like, oh, what am I, I going to do? These are my friends. I didn't know that was happening. Next thing you know, you begin... It begins to be seductive. You know how I know that kind of conversation is seductive? Look at TV. You want to know how I know that kind of conversation is seductive? There was a guy on television for a few decades. I think he may be on television still called Jerry Springer. He's not popular if that kind of conversation isn't seductive. Right? Because that's all that show is. Is gossip, right? It, that's it. Believe you never. <laughs> it's off stage too. This is real. All right, so so <laughs> we also have not just gossip groupies. We also have some ungodly unions, don't we? We hang out with people who honestly could care less about our God or His Word. If we keep this bad company, we will begin picking up their ungodly beliefs, their habits, and their behaviors. We will. Make no mistake about it. I cannot tell you how many people I've heard out of their mouths, they would say things like this. I would never fill in the blank. I would never say that. I would never do that. I would never be that kind of person. I would never treat someone that way. But when they get around an ungodly union, guess what happens over time? They begin doing that which they said they never would do. I'm here to tell you this morning that our actions will eventually mirror the company we keep. It will. So let me share this. This is a little personal. When I received Jesus Christ, I told you this is an opening. I was 15 years of age. So I had some friends. I had a really good group. I mean, we were tight, guys. I'm telling you. Y'all remember those childhood friends? Like, I mean, you know, you were blood brothers, and I don't know what's, are you blood sisters? Do you do that? I don't know. But, I mean, like, you know, I mean, like, you swap spit the whole nine yards. You know, sometimes you're really close, so you swap spit and blood, and you mix it together, and that was, okay, you didn't do that? Oh, yeah, we did. Well, maybe I didn't either. Um, but, but we were so close, right? We did everything together. And, and, and this was the group, let me just tell you, the group of friends I had. When I received Christ at 15, I realized something about this group of friends. I realized that I could not follow God's path in my life if I continued to hang out with these guys. Couldn't happen. Wasn't possible. You know why? Because I'm just going to be honest with you. Because of this group of friends that I had, I was introduced to pornography. It was my first experience with pornography with this group. Because of this group of friends I had, I was introduced to alcohol. Because of this group of friends, I was introduced to vandalism and mischief. Because of this group, I was introduced to drugs. 
Because of this group, I was introduced to all sorts of words that I didn't realize were that were so bad. Filth and filthy words. Because of this group of friends, I was introduced to so many ungodly activities. The very thoughts that when we got together had nothing to do with Christ, had nothing to do with God, had nothing to do with His Word. It was all about all the junk we could get into and get out of. You know what I'm saying? It was an ungodly union. And I realized that God had a plan and a purpose for my life. And there was no way for me to realize what He wanted me to do, to see it come to fruition, if I stayed with a group of friends that I was in. I looked at the Bible and what God desired for my life. And then I looked at my friends. I love them dearly. To this day, my heart hurts because we're not friends anymore, none of us. Yes, let me tell you, I shared the gospel with them. I shared Christ with them. But they didn't want Christ. They didn't want the gospel. They didn't want the word. I remember several times my friends calling me up and saying, I can't go there. I can't do that. I can't do that anymore. I can't go there anymore. Why? Because it's because I'm a Christian. And there's no way that God would love me, that would want me to do that. I can't do that. So guess what happened? My friendship gone. Those people. One of my friends got so badly addicted to drugs. By the way, the friend that introduced me to it got so badly addicted to drugs. Spent more than a decade in and out of rehab. Failed marriage. Lost his child. He was unfit. Another friend of mine in that same ungodly union <clears throat> man, spent a lot of time in jail. In and out of jail for the next decade. In and out of jail can I tell you, can I be honest with you? You see, in that moment of my life when I became a Christian, I realized, not that I was better than them at all, and that's not what I'm saying, but I realized in that very moment that if I continued with this ungodly union, that I too would end up where they are. I'm thankful to God that I made that decision. I, I still hurt for them. When I see them, I've seen them over the last 20 some years, every now and then, I'm not, it still hurts. Because I know the decisions they made, and I see, guys, I see how it's wrecked their life. But I'm telling you, I also know that I would have been right there. I would have been in and out of addiction clinics. I would have been in and out of rehab. I would have been in and out of jail. I would have been doing those things because we ran together, right? We ran together. We did everything together. Guys, I'm telling you, if you're a part of a gossip groupie, and if you're a part of an ungodly union, get out of there. Run out of there. And you might say to me, but they're my friends. Then if it's a gossip groupie that you, group that you're in, then set an example for them. When they begin to gossip, you tell them to stop. When they begin to gossip and they won't stop, you leave. When you're, when you're part of a group that's an ungodly union, you don't entertain the dirty, filthy jokes and language. Set an example. I, I want to I share this. This is something. I'm going to skip way down here. This is a statement. And you need to, please hear my heart. You need to follow this line of thought all the way through before you start thinking about what I'm about to say. I want you to hear this. Because this is a statement in our culture that's wrong. It's wrong. But we love, we love to think this way. And it's not right. Jesus did not hang out with sinners. Like, whoa, wait a second. I want you to follow along. Jesus didn't hang out with sinners. Jesus engaged sinners. There's a huge, hear me, there's a huge difference between the two. Jesus hung out with his disciples. Those are who he spent every minute of every day with. Those are who he, he spent every meal with. Those are who he poured into. He hung out with his followers. He did not hang out with sinners, but he engaged sinners in love. 
There's a difference. There's a big difference between the two. You see, we say statements like this, Jesus hung out with sinners, so, so I should hang out with sinners. No, you shouldn't. You should engage sinners in love. You should engage sinners in love. You see, Jesus didn't hang out with sinners. He engaged them. When he saw a sinner, he didn't see someone that would be fun to go bowling with. He didn't see someone that would be fun to go watch a movie with. He saw someone who was lost, who desperately needed his salvation. Amen. And so he engaged them. See, Jesus engaged the sinner to win them to faith. We can invite... Sure, we can invite an unsafe person to church, to movies, to definitely to church, by the way. But we can invite an unsafe person to a movie. We can invite an unsafe person to, out to eat. But not simply to hang out, folks. To love them to Christ. Amen. To love them to Christ. Because here's the reality. If you're hanging out with ungodly people who care nothing about your God, your Jesus, or the Word... And all you're doing is hanging out with them. And you spend a year with them without ever talking about God. Without ever talking about the Bible. Without ever talking about Jesus. Guess what? They will affect you. Amen. They, will, they will bring your morals down. They will bring your character down. You will begin to believe things that you shouldn't believe. Think things you shouldn't think. But let me tell you, if you do what Jesus did, and you really, you really love the sinner, which we do, right? We, man, we, we love the sinner. We, we want to engage the sinner like Christ. Then what we do is we, we get involved in those relationships, engage them in Jesus' name, love them in Christ. Guess what? When you're taking them out to eat, you're going to talk about Christ. And then that person who's lost has a decision to make. There's a crossroad, right? A crossroad. I go back to when I was 15 years old, when I shared, the, shared Christ with my friends at 15. They were at a crossroad. Do I continue to hang out with you because you're going to continue to talk about Jesus? Isn't it? So one of two things are going to happen. If you're engaged in like Christ, one of two things are going to happen. They're either going to continue to listen and to hear about God, about Jesus and His Word. And as long as they're listening and they're hearing, you're giving them the gospel. And there's a chance and someday they're going to receive Christ. Or, I am tired of this. I am tired of listening to you talk about God. I'm tired of you listening. Can we not just play video games? I'm tired of you talking about Jesus. Can we not just talk about the weather? I am tired of it and I am done with it. Not hanging out with you, and they begin to avoid your calls. They begin to avoid your company. Right? But if you're going to do what Christ did, He didn't hang out with sinners, He engaged them in the love of God. I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you real quick. So, you, so, so I'm not just making this up. This is biblical. In John 6, there was a great crowd following Jesus, right? There was a great crowd in John chapter 6. But Jesus didn't just want to hang out with this great crowd of people. He wanted them to have a relationship with God through Him. Right? So this large group catches up to Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 23, 25. This is the group that He fed of the 5,000. Remember that? Alright? When they catch up, when they find Jesus on the other side of the sea, they said to them, this great crowd said, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, 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 I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You're seeking me for the wrong reason. Many today would look at a pastor and say something like this. If I were to say that, some similar to a statement like this, Listen, you're not here for the right reason. You're here to be pampered and petted. Y'all would say, that passion doesn't love me and I'm Okay. That's done. We 
we would say, we would all say that that, that pastor up there in that pulpit, if he says that to a congregation, he's unloving and he's unkind. You hear what Jesus said? See, Jesus calls you to, make, to, to answer. He says, you come here seeking some bread. I can fetch you. You're not here to follow me. You're not here to receive me. I want you to follow, follow this. See, gee, while Jesus did uh, feed their bellies earlier, he was, uh, he was always way more, and, and his primary concern was their salvation. This is why when they catch up to Jesus, he says this, truly, truly, you're seeking me, but not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. He says, you guys just want me to me because of the blessings of a meal. That's all the reason this crowd wants me. You, this crowd, he says, you just want me because of a blessing of a meal. That's the only reason you're here. And they're not interested in accepting him as Savior and Lord. And then Jesus says this in 53 and 58 of John chapter 6. Listen to this. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Amen. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him, he says. And as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. Who, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. If Jesus was interested in just letting the crowd continue to hang out with him, he would never make a statement so bold. He wouldn't do it. He says, you've come. I fed your bellies. And you'd not come here for the right reason. You've come here because you want to continually have the blessings of a physical meal. But I've come to save you. If you're going to follow me, you have to consume all of me. Not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. Spiritually, you have to accept me as your everything. The meal that fills you up to eternal life, you have to accept it. See, that's the difference between hanging out with a sinner and engaging a sinner. At some point, you got to say, do you know Jesus Christ? I just want to tell you, what, what, um, what good do we do? If we have a, a group of friends who care nothing about our God, nothing about Jesus, nothing about His Word, and we spent 10 years with them and never talked about our God, Jesus Christ, or His Word, have you done them any favors? Do you, do you love them? Would, would it be loving of me to be around four lost people? Don't know God, don't know Christ, doesn't have the Holy Spirit, doesn't, doesn't know His Word, don't care about it. And spend... 10 years of my life with them just hanging out. Having the best time of our lives, going to movies, going to the beach, just doing stuff. But for a decade, I never once spoke of Christ. Do I love those people? A Christian has to say the answer is no, you don't. No, you don't, because if you did, you'd be engaging them for the sake of the gospel. intoxicated by the drink of bad company. We have become intoxicated with our gossip groups. We have become intoxicated with our ungodly unions. We are completely intoxicated. You know what? You know what happens when you're intoxicated, right? How many people remember what it's like to be intoxicated? Anybody? Thank you. Some honesty up in the room. Thank you, people. Honesty. You don't have control over your body. 
You don't. Some of you who won't dance ever get drunk and start dancing on a table. It's still bad. But that's what happens when we're drunk, right? We are not in our right minds. We are not controlled by our own faculties. We're actually controlled by the drink and doing things that we know we shouldn't do, saying things we know we shouldn't say. That's what happens here. Here's the scripture. That's what happens to you and I when we get into these gossip groups and these ungodly unions. When we get into bad company and we just hang out with this bad company, we eventually become, become intoxicated, right? With the things that they're saying and the negativity and the gossip and all the things that they're talking about. And we begin to get intoxicated in our beliefs and our thoughts and our actions and our morals and our character become flawed. Diminished and wrecked. I, as a pastor, have the privilege, I don't know if I'd call it an honor, because it's tough, but as a pastor in ministry, I've had to counsel many families. It's hard sometimes. And I have a husband and a wife coming to me who are having marital issues. And I begin talking to the husband. And I begin talking to the wife. And you know what I begin to find out? They've got bad company they're listening to. That wife has been listening to people at her work tell her, you don't need that man. You can do better. He's worthless. He's this, he's that. And I'm not talking about an abusive relationship, people. I'm talking about a good marriage that when you step back, it's a good thing. But they begin listening to all these people. And the husband, he, he's over here in pornography. He's over here in, in, in groups at work. And they're talking about uh, women as objects. Let's just put it that way. And they're talking about, man, you can look. You just can't touch. But you know what? Sometimes it's all right. As long as nobody knows. And that man is now caught up into something that he never should have been in, but he's been in that bad company. Can I just tell you what bad company are we listening to right now? What co-worker or co-workers are we listening to who have nothing to do, that they're not talking about God, they're not talking about our, our, our Christ, our Savior. They're not talking about His Word. They're giving us advice from Oprah. Come on now. They, they have given you the 411 of the Dr. Phil episode yesterday. Guys, we need, we need to pay attention. To who we've surrounded ourselves and our lives with. We must wake up from our drunken stupor as is right. Because here it says, and do not go on sinning. Guys, it's a sin to sit in a group of people and not speak up for Christ. Amen. Guys, it's a sin to, it's called the sin of omission. When we don't open our mouth about the gospel. When we don't open our mouth about Jesus. When we don't open our mouth about God's holy standard. It's a sin. Y'all please stand. I'm, I'm, I'm through. I'd like to clarify something as I finish. Who are we listening to who have no knowledge of God? I would like to tell you there's two types of people who fall in this category. One is the unsaved those who've never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, right? They don't care about God, they don't care about Christ, they don't care about His Word. But I want you to listen carefully. There's another person. These are the people who claim to be saved, but they're as worldly as they can be. You hear me? Oh, I'm a Christian? Really? Because the Bible and Christ has never affected your life. You're the same as you've always been. You live just like the world. As you always have. Can I tell you. When Christ enters in. You change. 
you change. If, if, the, if these people who claim to be Christians still live like the world, then they have no knowledge of God. Because if they truly had knowledge of God, they could not continue to live the way they're living. True knowledge of God brings about true change. So again, who are we listening to at work? Who are we listening to at school? Who are we listening to? What groups have we found ourselves in that we have no place being in as a, as a, child, of the, a child of the king? We need to get out of them. We need to run. Because we need to listen to it one more time and I'm going to pray. We need to stop allowing ourselves to be deceived. You know what? We need to stop being deceived and thinking it's not a big deal. It's no big deal. We're just hanging out together. It's no big deal. Can I tell you something that affects, I wasn't even going to say this, I'm going to say this, something that affects us, bad company. We keep bad company and those people are, are found on our radio. Right? Come on. Y'all don't want to even that one? Because we do. See, it's different in our day, right? Because we have all this media and stuff that's pouring into our lives. And we allow our time to be consumed with this ungodly influence in our life. And we need to get away from it. I, 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 was, I, I finished with this. I'm done. Stop being deceived. But here's the thing. I was talking to a man last year on my front porch. He walked up to my front porch at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. And I don't own a gun, but I was like, check him out. <laughs> and he's laughing at me. But here's the thing. So he comes up to my house. This is the second time I've talked to this guy in the course of a couple of years. He's riddled with drugs. He's making so many bad decisions in his life. He sits down at my porch and I begin to talk to him and I begin to ask him, who are your friends? Well, I just got out of, he had just gotten out of jail and came straight to my house to talk to me. I said, who are your friends? The same people. The same people. I said, you need new friends. I'm telling you right now, I can't tell you how many people that I know that have been addicted to drugs and go through rehab and get off drugs, but then go right back to the same group of friends and guess what happens? They get right back on the drugs because you've got to change those group of friends. Amen. They are not friends if they are causing you to run away from God and His Word. Amen. They are not your friends. Now love them. Engage them in the name of Jesus Christ. Share the gospel with them. But you need a new group. You need to find a Sunday school class to plug into and to get to know folks and get to discipled and loved. You need to find a disciple group. Guess, guess what? I'm going to just tell you right now. You need to look around the building and look at people that you respect in Christ. I didn't say just respect in general. I said respect in Christ. That you look around. If you're a lady, you looked around this building. You, you look around. You find a lady that's following hard after Christ. And you go to that lady and say, I want you to be in my group. I want you to mentor me. I want you to disciple me. I want, to be a, I want you to pour into my life. Because I've seen your life. And I, I need to be more like Christ. You're a man. You look around this room. You find a, a, a couple of men. Ladies, you find a couple of ladies. But men, men, you find a couple of men. Two, three men. And you see them. And you look at them and say, that's the kind of life. That's the kind of godly husband I need to be. That's the kind of godly father I need to be. That's the kind of godly man I need to be. And you grab them. You talk to them and say, I need you in my life. My life is filled with the wrong influence. I need you in my life. Father God, I love you so much and I thank you. God, I praise you. God, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you break down the veil, that you tear the veil of deception from our eyes, from our minds, from our very hearts. Even in my own life, God, 
even after I've been saved, God, I have found myself in these groups at times, and I've found myself breeding negativity right there with them and, and talking about people just the same way they are. And God, it was so ungodly and it was so wrong, and I was right there. God, I confess, I ask you to forgive me. I have before I even got up here, God, because I know I can't preach this and not confess it, not repent of it, Father. God, I pray you challenge all of us to be willing to, to confess, to repent of the sins that we're doing, to choose not to hang out with, but to engage the lost in love, engage the lost. And God, with the be honest about the groups that we're in right now. The groups I'm in, all of us. God, are these groups that glorify you? And are these groups that, that help us grow in your word and in you, Christ? Are these groups that take us closer to the cross? Or God, are we honest that these groups are not? But these groups glorify everything that Satan absolutely loves and adores. I just pray, Lord, that we would repent. And I pray, Lord, you give us boldness and courage and strength because it's hard. I remember at 15 how heartbroken I was when, when I could not hang out with this group of friends that I'd spent almost every day with for two and a half years. And it hurts and it's hard. But God, if we're going to follow you and we're going to see the plan that you have for us, God, we've got to make that decision. I just pray for courage and boldness in this room today. Help us, Lord. I love you so much, and I praise you in the name of Jesus Christ.